and I ask David to come on stage. Please, a warm welcome and applause. Yes, I want to take you to 1888, a winter night in Geneva. A guy, an entrepreneur who's on top of his game, he was an agile leader, he had a huge company which was very successful. And he was visiting Geneva in a winter evening, he was reading the paper. Merchant of death has passed away yesterday. And then his name, Alfred Nobel. Well, he was shocked twice. First of all, he was still alive. So he called the paper and he said, what's happening? And apparently they had made a mistake. But you know, he was even more shocked of the title that they gave him, Merchant of Death. Alfred Nobel was the inventor of dynamite. He had factories all over the world and he was very rich. But that moment there and then was a pivotal moment in his life because he said, I don't want that to be my legacy. And there, at that moment, he decided to sell his companies, a share in his factories, and he put that money into a foundation. And how do we know the name Nobel now? What do we want to be known for? We are leaders, we are agile, we're moving around. What choices do we have to make to create our legacy? Let me tell you a bit about myself. I am born in the Netherlands. After my engineering and MBA, I got into the private sector. I was an agile leader. But I made a visit to Kenya and to Somalia. And this changed my world. And you know, there in the business district of Amsterdam, I was for 80% in charge of the projects and also responsible and under control of the success of those projects for 80%. And it was only like 20% that you couldn't control external factors. But then in the projects I saw in Kenya and Somalia, in the humanitarian sector, I found out that you only control 20% of the projects because there's so many external factors. So I moved from the business sector to the humanitarian sector and I found MEDER, this wonderful organization that has its mandate to go to the most remote and the most difficult and the most needy areas of this world. And after training and some development and I worked in different areas, I was made responsible for the program in South Sudan. Uh, I was there with my wife. We were in Kenya during a break and no one could reach us. One of our colleagues, Henny DeVay, passed away because of an accident. And only later we found out, so we came back. And I was shocked. As I said, I couldn't control it. You know, I was the agile leader that had everything under control. I wanted to be in control of everything. And now I was in South Sudan going to help people in need and I couldn't even take care and protect my own team. It was one of the lowest moments in my life. In moments like this, when we don't know what to do, when we're struggling, we need a secure base. It can be a person, a place, a goal or an object that provides a sense of protection, safety and caring and offers a source of inspiration and energy for daring, exploration, risk-taking and seeking challenge. And clearly, I couldn't change this situation I was in and I had to let go. And my secure base, both family and my faith have been so essential and it's not just the humanitarian sector, I think any sector you're in, we need a secure base. George Colreza has written that wonderful book, Care to Dare. 
And he's saying, we can only dare if we're cared for. And let me give you an example. When I, my daughter Lily, my oldest daughter Lily, when she was five years old and she learned to bike, I had to apply this caring and daring. So I encourage her, explain to her, I put her on a bike, I stay next to her, I hold her shoulder and make sure she doesn't fall. And then slowly, but because of my care, she then dares to go biking. If I would have done too much caring, I would have said, Lily, just stay home. Biking is too dangerous. But then she would have never enjoyed biking and the freedom of biking. If I would have been too daring, I would have said, here's a bike, you just go off by yourself. But she would have fallen. She would injure herself and maybe even traumatize. So it's this combination of caring that allows daring with our children. But the thing is, it doesn't change. It's the same for us as adults. That's why we need a secure base, because that secure base provides that care that allows us then to dare. We as humanitarians in the humanitarian world, we take stock of what's happening in this world and every year we look at the current state of the world. Currently we have 8 billion people in the world, but did you know that we've never had so many refugees? UNHCR tells us we have 100 million refugees. You know, most refugees are because of conflicts and wars. But then there's also climate change, flooding, droughts. And then World Food Programme reported that 860 million people go to bed hungry. And do you know that actually we have the resources to address these issues if it was well distributed? But let's also look closer to home. I mean, we have had the virus of COVID, the pandemic, but there's also a virus of loneliness with the consequences of the Ukraine war and impact on prices and travel and, and all of these things. One assessment said that 60% of the people in Europe have fear and depressive feelings about the future. We need that secure base. But then the next question is, how can we become a secure base for others? And George uh, mentions quite a list of characteristics and I just want to highlight a few of them. The first one is a secure base leader accepts the individual. He or she accepts and acknowledges the basic worth of others as a human being. Actually, for us in Medair, we have defined it as dignity. What we believe as Medair is that everyone, irrespective of your background, your religion, your social status, your nationality, your skin color, everyone has value. And we see so often in the areas where we work that, that dignity is being abused. And let me give you an example. In uh, my last visit to Bangladesh, Bangladesh is one of the largest refugee camps with Rohingyas. Rohingyas have fled Bangladesh. Men have been killed, women have been raped, have been chased out, and they're now in Bangladesh. And we are doing a nutritional program. And when I was there, the team had a problem. The Rohingya mothers had said, there's something wrong with the food. And so it was just poor quality and even as bad that the children got sick from it. The team had reported that to the supplier, but the supplier had said, you know, you, you have signed for it, so don't complain, just distribute it to the Rohingya refugees. And so the team brought it up in the coordination meeting, and again it was said, well, why are you so making such a fuss uh, matter and complaining? You're the only one. And then the team managed to make some pictures under a microscope because there apparently were very small ants in this food. And they reported it back as WFP was coordinating it. WFP management said, thank you, Medair, for bringing this up and standing up for the rights of the Rohingya ladies. They might be stateless, they might be refugees, but they're dignified people. 
They have the right to have good food. And so WFP corrected it and the supplier was replaced by another one who could provide the quality food that was needed. And I was so impressed with our team because that's exactly what dignity is about. You can work with suppliers, with clients, with your own team members, anyone. Focus on the person, focus on the individual. The next thing that is mentioned, which is essential for a secure base leader, is to be calm. The secure base leader stays calm. He or she remains composed and dependable, especially when under pressure. Times at which other leaders may respond impulsively and unreasonably. Well, we experienced this when the war in Ukraine started. For us, it was a shock, of course, but we are called and our mandate is to respond. And so for me and our management team, we had to decide, you know, we're a mid-sized organization and we're already so busy and working everywhere and we didn't have, you know, money in the bank to, to just kind of respond and do a new program. And we, of course, consulted our colleagues and the teams and everyone said, we need to go. This is so big and there's so many people fleeing. And so I had to stay calm and involve people. And then eventually we came to a decision and we sent a team. And now the program in Ukraine has become huge. And so when I was there, I realized, and I think many of us don't realize, but there are constant air raid sirens because of the bombing that goes on. And it's daily. And then people have to go to basements to protect themselves and their children. And when I talked to the team about it, Damien, our country director there, I said, how can you cope? I mean, even, you know, the, the, the sleep deprivation, you, 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 you don't have time and you have to keep working. He said, it's by being together. So even in, in those basements, it's dark. They have small lights and they do games. They tell stories. And Damien said, we're like a family, sticking together and supporting and encouraging each other. That is that secure base. And then, as soon as the air raid siren stops, they go out and they start working again and helping people in need. But a secure base leader also then encourages this risk-taking, this daring. They actively dare people to unleash their potential by providing tangible opportunities for risk-taking. They support the autonomy of their followers, and their followers do not feel over control. 60% of the people, Ukrainians, have lost their jobs because of the war. And when I was in Ukraine, I met Natalia. She, I was in uh, Ternopil, which is in the middle of the country, and she was working with the government, and, and so she applied, and we recruited her, and she started small, and then the team gave her a lot of responsibility and a budget. You know, eventually she became the operational coordinator of this whole area. As our mandate is to go where the needs are the highest, we went closer to where the war is. And you know who was the first to volunteer? It was Natalia. And not only that she wanted to volunteer and risk her life to go there, she even had saved up the money of the budget in Ternopil to be used. And I asked her, how, how were you able to do that? You had a government job, you know, which was calm, and now you're out there and you're even going to the most difficult places, risking your life to help people in need. And she said, it's because of the care I get, the empowerment the support, the encouragement. They give me so much freedom, so much responsibility. And that allows me to be courageous and to be daring. And again, I thought, there you go. It's this caring which leads to daring. And Natalia was showing it and is showing it now as we speak every day. I can say, I've learned so much from Damien, from George, from Alfred Nobel, from Natalia, and so many other of my colleagues. What I see then when I visit Bangladesh and Ukraine and so many other programs is that hope is stronger than fear. Love is stronger than hate. Courage is stronger than cowardness. 
dignity is stronger than abuse. And so I want to encourage you and myself to find our secure base and then be secure base for others. And that's what we do in Medair every day. And that's what I encourage you to do wherever you work. Care in order to dare.